Hello everyone, um, I'm Susan Tomaselli, writer in resident at Maynooth University. As part of my residency, I'm presenting a series of events with leading writers, artists and publishers, exploring the practice of writing. Um, before we begin with tonight's conversation, I'd like to thank Kildare Libraries and Kildare Arts Office, who alongside Maynooth University make this residency possible. This event is Writing is Sound, and I'm joined by Wendy Erskine and Daniela Caskella. Wendy Erskine lives in Belfast. Her work has been published in The Sting Fly, Winter Papers, Female Lines, Being Various, The Art of the Glimpse, and a lot of other places, and has been read on Radio 4. Her first collection, Sweet Home, was published by The Sting and Fly Press in 2018 and Picador in 2019. It was long listed for the Gordon Byrne Prize and shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness Prize and the Edge Hill Prize. Lucy Caldwell has called the work whip smart and witty and tender and wry. She writes that these stories bring a brand new Belfast into sharp focus. Wendy's pitch perfect dialogue attuned to the way people speak and to what they let slip without meaning to is a joy. Her writing is sly and stylish and unsentimental. There's a new star in the East. Daniela Caskella is an Italian writer whose works articulate tensions and points of contact between the literary and the sonic and propose a range of approaches to creative critical writing through experiments with form and voice. She is the author of uh, Singed, uh, Muted Voice Transmissions After the Fire, published by Equus Press 2017, FM RL Footnotes, Mirages, Refrains and Leftovers of Writing Sound, published by Zero Books 2015, and On a Beam, Listening, Reading and Writing and Archival Fiction, again Zero Books 2012. Daniela's writing has been published in anthologies and the exhibition catalogues internationally. She's the Associate Lecturer in the MA of Sound Arts at uh, LCC, University of Arts London, and is completing her PhD at Sheffield Hallam University, where she be, she's been developing a project around chimeric writing. The Journal of Sonics study said, Singed is a concentrated and committed effort to surrender writing to sound, as well as to find her own voice again. In this short section, sorry, in short, this section embodies all that is unique about Skella's writing. If singed is fragmentary, it is also dub. In singed, that central question at the heart of Caskella's writing is repeated again, but with much greater volume. How is one meant to write and speak in the wake of experiences, confrontations and events that expose us to and remind us of the abyssal, of, the abyssal root of uh, language? So normally at this point, I ask some questions, but I'm going to invite um, a reading first. Um, Wendy, could I ask you to go first, if that's Certainly. okay? Certainly, thank and you. And if you, if you could introduce the piece that you're gonna read. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Susan. And uh, it's lov lovely to be here uh, this evening. Um, I'm gonna read a piece, um, a piece of writing called Parry a Magic. And it's from a, a collection of writing about Paris um, called We'll Never Have Paris um, from um, Repeater Books in 2019. And Susan is in this book um, as well. It's a really, really interesting and quite diverse um, anthology of writing about Paris. Um, I decided to write about an individual who basically had no interest in Paris um, whatsoever in terms of that whole kind of, you know, Shakespeare and company style literary culture. Um, and so what I was writing about here was someone who loves a um, simulated version of Paris that comes across through sorts of sort of pixels and sound, because this is somebody who accesses Paris every single day because they play FIFA um, and they particularly focus on the Paris Saint-Germain ground. That is where they are. So this is an individual who dislikes French, who has no interest in Paris, but is basically accessing it daily. Um, and it's just a substantial, possibly more substantial part of this individual's daily experience than the sort of literary aspect might be for, um, for, for many people. Um, the reason I want to read it this evening is because this is very much sound based and the whole piece started from a kind of a corruption of language and sound. Um, it was the phrase uh, sacre bleu that I heard an individual going to declare my son. Um, 
reinterpret as suck my blah. Um, that he had said that they had picked this up in school, that the teacher said this thing, um, sacra blah, sacra blah, and that sort of transmogrified into suck my blah. Um, so that is what I want to um, read the, this evening. So basically he's on his way home from um, school on the bus, but the whole time thinking of Paris and thinking about the sounds and the sights of Paris that are transmitted to him through this game. Bus is rammed, always full on the wet days, and that nutter three seats behind him, heavy guy who elbowed him in the face so that his teeth snagged on the inside of his cheek. Been sucking a big sweet at the time, so the slobbers he spat out were blue and red. Doesn't like the two teachers he had this afternoon, Miss Hines and Madame McGuigan. Hines didn't let them do a practical today. Come on, Miss, like, what's the point if we don't cook anything? Did about food safety instead. Don't reheat this, don't reheat that. But she was pissed off because somebody messed about with one of the baguettes that was there from the other class, kidding on it was his dick. Quit that, she said, quit that. You think somebody's going to want to eat that after your dirty paws have been all over it? A crowd down the back of the bus are flicking bits of rubber at people. Not sore, just annoying. Head again, back of the neck. You going to stop that, comes a voice. You's gonna stop that, begged Dawn, trying to put stuff in her face with a brush. You gonna wise up? They repeat what she's saying, high and whingy. Gonna stop that, gonna stop that, sacre bleu, sacre bleu. The guy that came in when Madame McGuigan was off for the month told them the words sacre bleu. That fellow with a shitty wee car that you're shagging wagon. No more of that, please, he said. Sacre bleu, sacre bleu, sack my bleu, suck my bleu, suck my blah. Everybody was saying it. Hey, suck my blah, suck my blah, why don't you? A bag's just got emptied on the floor. Stuff will get booted around. We guys scrambling to try to get it back. We guy cares about his pencil case. He's not going to get that stuff back. Suck my blah. Why don't you stop and pay attention? Heinz said this afternoon. Don't know. This is important. To be fair, miss, it's not. What did you say? I beg your pardon. Right out. Wrote stuff on a bit of paper and sent him to see the year head, the wee guy who looks like Martin Tyler but with a fatter face. Dandered off to see the year head. Jeez, this bus driver must be a learner because what speed are we going at? Crawling along. His shoes are too small, they're toe pokers bought for that cousin's wedding and the marriage is already on the rocks, his mum says. Kick those shoes off when he gets in. Take off the fucking tie, strangling him all day. Be home soon now anyway. Shit, what's that? Felt more like a coin hitting him this time but soon he'll be home soon he'll be pressing the white button though hearing the little flute of sound toodaloo toodaloo the whir inside ah okay switch on the tv and there will be Two guys in the front seat taking it in turn to dig each other's arms, hitting on bruises there from the day before. Guy that covered for Madame McGuigan said they don't go out in France, Paris, places like that. They go, aye. Nobody believed that because you don't go, aye, no matter where you're from. Wise up, like, wise fuck up. Nobody goes, aye. They started hitting each other, aye, aye. Suck my blah, suck my blah. Guy went crazy. The bus breaks and they're flung forward and then back like in the car crash ads, but only just a bit. Somebody drums their phone against the window, quicker and quicker. Somebody bangs the seat, but a big paint splash. FIFA 19. English. Press that. The swirl then. Late for Madame McGuigan this afternoon because of having to see that year head. Headed down the corridor to her room past all the flags. Somebody said to the guy that was in for McGuigan, you not got the gay flag, the rainbow flag? No, he said, because gay is not a country. Madame McGuigan asked something when he came in. Don't know, miss, don't know at all. And she did that dopey thing. Held her hands up to her ears like the words were disgusting. She did that when you tried to speak normal and not the I language, suck my blah. Tried to explain why he was late, but she just made more of the normal and pointed at the free chair at the front. Oh well, whatever, suit yourself. But anyway, UEFA Champions League. Select country. Country France. AS Monaco. Nantes. Montpellier. Nîmes. Olympic. 
Nice, Paris Saint Germain, always gonna be Parc des Prince. Yeah, Parc des Prince. When he sat down, Madame McQuiggan started playing something. It babbled away, everybody wriggled in their seats. Suck my blah, somebody whisper, then fill in the worksheet. It's down the bottom of the bag now. Drink leaked out this morning, so it'll have turned to mush. Madame McGuigan's got a big poster behind her desk, a couple sitting at a table in a street. We wait her coming over with a tray, but so fucking what places like that in the town? There was even a place in the town at a rat. Somebody filmed it through the window late at night when it scurried round the cafe. Big old rat-like. Okay, go with Barcelona. Shooting basics, crappy wee spot like the school pitch. Shooting basics with its wee park benches. All right, Park de Prince. Push, and he hits the cold metal of the seat in front, hard whack on his ear so there's silence, and then every sound's like at the swimming pool. Don't turn round to look at the big guys he's getting off, even though he can nearly taste the sweet bloody slobber again. Just look out the window, watch that man getting the black bag ready as that big dog crouches at the bus shelter. That one that's always wrecked the plastic over the timetable, bubbled with a cigarette lighter, but Park Day Prince. Grey sky, but no shadow. Dazzle of the lights. Crisscross, crosshatch. Bright white. The red and blue squares. Paris a magique. Wrap around. Only the grey up above. Wrap around. The six dark green stripes. Six light green stripes. Squares, blue and red. Triangles of flag. Snug in the Parc des Princes. Happy shapes of sounds from the crowd. And it's going to start soon. Revant plus grand. Revant plus grand. Everything's going to go grand. It's what that means. Or something like that. Doesn't really matter. Suck my blah. Paris. Et magique. Suck my blah. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thanks very much. Um, that's almost... Um, I'm not sure correct terminology is it but um i know that in music um when you mishear a lyric it's called a Mond mondrian but thank you and we'll, we'll maybe talk to daniela later about um misinterpretation on, and language daniela could i ask you to read and um, maybe um frame what you're gonna read um i think it more like frames itself it's about my uh impossibility to write, uh, my inability to write, and um, uh, hearing voices in books uh, and being um, summoned by reading. So I'll just start. It starts from me trying to write a book by an Italian writer um, that was written in the 70s. So. The book was written by Giorgio Manganelli. Its title is Le Interviste Impossibili, The Impossible Interviews. Not translated in English from Italian to date, the Adelphi edition contains 12 imaginary conversations between an elusive interviewer and dead characters across history and legend, such as Marco Polo, Harun al-Rashid, Tutankhamun, evoke through ambiguous traits of their personality that suffuse the pages with the metaphysical light of their absurd premise. Impossible, the book's title, impossible for me to write about it. It is an extraordinary book and I cannot find words for its extra. I have read it again and again, underlined its pages until the pencil marks cut through the paper, signs of bodily pressure into the impossible to tell. The pencil sharpened as if to compensate for the lack of a sharp point in my understanding. Perhaps no sharpness is necessary here, but a more unstable quality that lodges in hearing what voices are heard in those impossible interviews? Heard, after all, is an anagram of red with the ad added H of a breath. Listening here lifts words off the page into the realm of resonance. As I listen to those imaginary conversations, I find myself entangled in the undulating imprecision and presence of voices heard in reading, which demands a language equally present, undulating and impure. I have nothing to write but the necessity of staying with this book, yearning for its words, and for writing nothing and for more words, which may hold the time spent with it, all in nothing, I have nothing, or at least I have nothing forward, conventionally. 
nothing that could fulfill the common expectations of writing about a book as reviewing, of offering context, analysis, judgment, to dissect it by means of erudition. But I never read for erudition. I read for connections, even when most unlikely or unhinged. Sometimes the hinges break and I am left with a silence so deafening that I can only fill it with laughter. Manganelli's book is written in Italian. I am not a translator. And what drives a critic who is exhausted from dwelling in the entanglements of reading, but is not exhausted in mentioning sources she cannot quote? Exhausted, worn out. Like the smoothed feet of those marble statues in Italian churches that have been touched so many times, they have lost their initial form, only to carry the stamp of devotion that often is obsession, the erasing and changing mark of time spent, which may smoother, which may smother. So the critic and her subjects are spent, worn out, transformed. Writing this limit, writing my speechlessness, calls for different ways of being with Manganelli's book. Not reading as a distant critic, but hearing and engaging in a conversation with those characters in agreement as much as interruption, interference, disturbance. I cannot take the book as a case study. I shattered the glass case under which the material of study is kept and long for writing a weighted reverberance and enmeshment inside and with. Because the conversation is impossible and because I hear it in reading, I must write it. Such present and absent conversation happens in the form it happens, which says something about how I listen, how I fabricate language, the kinships I perceive, the sympathetic frequencies which draw me to certain materials. In singular acts of reading through tonal encounters, always akin, always slightly out of sync, and then again exhaustion, excitement, the ways in which a critic grasps for that secret core, that mass of yearning, emotion, interference, incongruence, and thinking with her materials that make her right. The impossibility of writing around Manganelli's impossible interviews is also bound to my awareness of the book's faint sound. Faint for its subjects at times baffling, at times abrasive, full of histories and themes so specific, non-topical, or out of currency that they might sound empty. Who will receive? Who will tune in? When you are pushed outside of certain legitimate circle or literary anything that deem you to be literally nothing, who is there to hear? Is amplification necessary when certain signals demand to stay faint? What is perceived as emptiness of argument is in fact a vessel forming to hold the transformation of the residual and recursive material of knowing instead of the evidence and mass of knowledge. Caught between the need to transmit faint sounds and the high chances of not being received, I long for a type of hearing attuned to detect other faint voices. So it diverts from the apparent void silence that is only a superficial contrast to loudness. There is no such thing as void silence. There are volumes which will never be loud enough because if they do, they get distorted and lose texture. Better to tune in the hearing than force a faint signal to scream. These signals may appear isolated because of the non-immediacy of references or cultural context that they hold. They need wildly imaginative forms of hearing and reading and impure forms of writing Monstrous writing is attuning, attuned hearing and reading. This form of attunement can be frightening. Frightening, as William Carlos Williams said to the Italian writer Cristina Campo on reading her works on his poetry. I do not think that anyone on this earth would ever find me out among my writings as you have done or would care to do so much for me. You have turned me inside out, stripped me bare, and I'm not even embarrassed, but on the contrary, welcome you as a lover and a friend. Nothing physical about it, it goes deeper than that, is why I say it frightens me. We do not in this world admit such intimacies. We have to hide them from each other, but you have found me out, I am frightened by it. 
I want to write this sense of being frightened and compelled by words that find me out when I read. The silence that continues to overwhelm and exhaust makes me present and strange. The fullness of hearing voices in books, even if impossible or dead, where words haunt me from times before me. They are suddenly saturated with meaning, only to withdraw again, and I talk with them. I am eloquently interrupted by them and then disturbed. I take leave from them, and I am there as I was nearly there, have always been there and have never been. To write yearning, which gives voices their purpose, even if it is only dust, even if the signal is faint. In monstrous mutations never mute. It is difficult to write this, groundless, but not without grounds. And yet writing is my vessel, writing is my limit, my voices, my impure, monstrous, loud silence that never allows me to think I have done. Thank you very much. Um, if I could start with you, Wendy, um, in the intro, I quoted another writer mentioning your Pitch Perfect dialogue, and I think you demonstrated that in your reading. Um, is that where it begins for you with voice? Is that how you invent a story? Yeah, right. I, I am really, really interested in, um, I'm really, really interested in dialogue. I'm really, really interested in speech. And what I'm interested in, I suppose, in terms of writers, there's a sort of an, a continuum from kind of something that absolutely mimics real speech to something that's sort of highly stylized, bravura, sort of pithy, epigrammatic, elegant speech. Um, and I would be much more down the other end of the continuum from, from that. Um, and so I suppose for me, I'm interested in speech and I'm interested in the sort of non-fluency features. So I'm interested in repetition. I'm interested in circumlocution. I'm interested in, in, in a syntax. Um, and I'm interested in trying to represent that as accurately as, uh, as, as possible. Um, but I'm also interested in the sense that w whatever we say, the conversation is not necessarily about what's been vocalised, that there is going to be some sort of um, subtext. Um, and so I do spend an awful lot of time going, give me that, will you, will you give me that? Are you going to give me that? You know, to try to work out what's quite right. Um, I can remember one time in a, in a shopping centre hearing somebody say, uh, there, was a, there was a woman in front of me and she had a, a child with a beautiful little cardigan. And I said, um, what a beautiful cardigan. And she said, yeah, her other granny knit her that, right? And to me, that that was so revelatory. I mean, that was incredible. Just that little, the other granny knit it said so much. So, so for me, um, in terms of... Um, in terms of speech and in terms of trying to get dialogue right, yeah, I'm trying to do it to make it seem um, realistic and in inverted commas, because, yeah, of course, I know that realism is as much of a convention and, a, you know, a construct as anything else. But that's the way I'm trying to I'm trying to do it. And uh, uh, Daniela, um, Wendy struck on, on the silence there. That's something that's it's quite um, important to your work. Um, it's not the absence of sound, but it's it's the space in between. Um, and the most recent book of yours I read, uh, uh, Singed, it's about you trying to recover your voice and you're writing through fading references. You're you're almost um, not really a spoiler, but you're raking through the ashes of of legacy. Could you could you tell me about that book? Um, the circumstances and are they real or not? And how how you went about that? Um, and the, though the book reads and it, it's pitched um, as an improvisation, it's a lot more controlled than that, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. It was, it was, it's interesting you're asking me about the, the circumstances of, of the book. Um, it starts with a fire, it starts with a whole library uh, set on fire. Um, and um, it happened actually, it happened in my parents' house a few years ago. And at the time, um, I wasn't quite sure uh, what to do with it. All my old paperbacks, all my books just got burnt basically. So, um, and it stayed with me for a few years and I knew that something had to happen. And then, and then I thought, well, uh, could I use this as an image to work with? I think it's really important for, for me to have these strong symbols when I start a project. And, and that, that idea of, of the library on fire uh, <laughs> seemed to, to be important in the sense of um, how do I how do I 
carry all this um, mm, all these words and all these thoughts and 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 and, and emotions and and uh, ways of understandings that have been formed through throughout those books uh, they're no longer there so how do I work with with the, the residues from from memory from starting to in, interweaving memories rather than than hard evidence of, of words uh, so I guess that was the starting point and then and then I became more interested in um, uh, how how the same material can be um, obvious to the point of cliche in, 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 in Italy and, and completely obscure in, in, in English speaking, for English speaking read, readership. So I, I was really interested in, in, putting, in putting side by side um, a singer, a pop singer who's extremely popular in, in Italy and nobody knows here uh, and to write something about him and um, sorry to jump in. That's um, Lucio uh, Battista. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was, all my friends, if I told them I was writing about him in Italy, would be like, "Oh my god, you're selling out!" You can... <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it becomes this precious, this precious and obscure, obscure reference here. Um, and on the other hand of the spectrum, I, I wanted to write something about a writer who's been over and over. I wanted to write about Clarice Lispector, who's been over and over and over uh, worked and studies, especially in the last few years. So I, I was really interested in putting the two together as, as an experiment to, yeah. And um, in, in the book you described as um, dubbing Clarice Lispector, what, what do you mean <laughs> by that for people who aren't um, familiar with music terminology? What's, would, what's a dub? I just wanted to do to to write dub version of Clarice to to keep the bass um, and and the rhythm uh, and and take all the rest out of the of the work. Um, I think it was really important for me conceptually to be able to write about her because she was so important. But at the same time, I realized that so much had been written. Uh, so how do you how do you um, how do you place yourself in a in a context that uh, that is so populated? Uh, and so uh, I became interested in thinking through the idea of the dub. Uh, I want to remix Clarice. I want to I want to do I want to do something. I want to use that material as something that is um, has got a, a heartbeat for me, and it's and it's got. Also, the dub is interesting because there's always something ghostly about dub. There's always something not entirely there. There's always something haunting about dub sounds and dub music. So um, yeah, I guess I guess it was important conceptually to be able to articulate something and do something with it. Yeah, I I find the quote of yours, Daniela, in uh, Singe on silence that I wanted. It it, it goes, "And um, writing is never only words on paper." From within its knots of silence, through repetition and stillness, it holds and demands gestures prompts breathing, rhythm, spaces, points at its excess and what is around it and how we're around it outside frames. Um, frames keeps popping up in your work quite a lot. Um, frames and framing. And I'm mentioning this because we read some Brian Eno in our uh, creative writing class and he was saying how much he liked frames. So he liked the context rather than the, the content. Is, is that a driving factor in your work? And I'm also referring back to the, the piece of yours that I published a very long time ago in Gorse on, on framing. How important is framing to your work? Um, I guess in the case of Gorse, uh, that was very important in the essay because I was thinking about the sound of the slides that Pierpaolo Pasolini heard during his art, art history classes in Bologna. So that was about the frame of the slide and how that could become a rhythm for, for my, for arranging my thinking around uh, Pasolini on a very lateral, from a very lateral uh, point of view, not, definitely again, not, 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 again, Pasolini is another one who's got so much literature and yet how do I approach uh, the subject um, uh, through cadence, through, mm -hmm. through cadence. Um, at the moment, I'm actually uh, more sc 
skeptical around the idea of frame. Uh, the more I write, the, the more I become interested in um, the core that moves writing, the, 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 the necessity that moves writing. So rather, rather than an external frame, I'm kind of turning the, the subject inside out and, and uh, becoming more and more concerned um, with, uh, yeah, what is at the core of a project and how that uh, can expand. So yeah, I think that's my, in, in, in brief, uh, the answer, the answer to that. Thank you. Wendy, I can't invite you to uh, an event on sound without talking about your reclusive rock icon, uh, Gil. Could you maybe talk about, um, could you put uh, Gil Courtney in context? And <laughs> I could. So the so legacy. Good. Yeah, yeah. Gil, Gil Courtney, so one of, one of the stories in my collection is, is 77 pop facts about this, this fictitious um, pop icon, rock icon, Gil Courtney, who is kind of like an amalgamation of, I don't know, Sid Barrett, Jean Clark, any any number of kind of um, sort of people who just never, never quite, um, never quite made it. I'm also aware of how ridiculous that kind of sounds, me sitting in my little house here talking about somebody like Sid Barrett or Jean Clark as somebody who didn't quite make it you know but basically what happens is um i kind of try to weave in um reality and this person who's entirely fictitious um and told it in the form of pop facts of the type that you would get in something like smash hits or whatever so it's 77 little facts i had struggled with a story i had 20,000 words maybe a little bit longer i told it from any number of different points of view from his mother's point of view his point of view it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't. It wouldn't take off. And then, whenever um, I struck on the idea of telling it in terms of in terms of facts, um, supposed facts, um, I was able to get it get it done very very um, very very quickly, and it all kind of fell into um, place. But. As a result, sometimes people have thought this is a real person, and um, because I, I deliberately reference reality, I, I deli and because the word facts, even in this age of sort of like post truth or whatever, you know, the word facts still carries a, a kind of a weight, and so people have said to me things like, "Oh, you know, I've heard this guy's music on Discogs. I, I didn't think he was all that. Doesn't surprise me that he didn't become a success or whatever." But the story of Gil Courtney, I suppose, is just a. It, it, it's a very archetypal tale of someone who, who, who maybe could could have been something um, absolutely um, splendid, but it just didn't uh, it just didn't happen. Um, and I suppose you know in that respect, in terms of in terms of writing, I suppose people write about the things that are of interest in their world, and quite often I end up writing about um, worlds that are to do with sound. Um, just because that's what I'm just generally, I suppose, interested in. So, you know, I'll, I'll write about um, pop stars or I'll write about um, people, you know, making music just because that's what I, I, I like, I suppose, just, just day to day. That was going to be my next question to you, actually. Um, I was going to say that music is all over and through um, Sweet Home. How much of that... Um, is to do with growing up in the north of Ireland, do you think? And I suppose what I mean by that is, do you find music was um, an alternative identity um, and other to the uh, usual religious sectarian identifiers? Totally so, yeah. I mean, I did a thing in a bar in Belfast and it was not all that long ago. And I was basically being being asked in this bar in Belfast not all that long ago, and it was, it was an interview that was being televised are you a Protestant or a Catholic? Do you see yourself within this tradition or that tradition of writing? And I ended up saying, oh, I consider myself a Velvet Underground fan. And it sounded dopey in a sense. It sounded really dumbass um, because it sounded so apolitical. Um, but at the same time, I absolutely, I absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to say that because there's alternative ways of, of, of identifying yourself, there's alternative ways of defining yourself. And I suppose, you know, for me, and again, Susan, you know, I couldn't speak for anybody other than, other than myself. For me as a teenager in the north of Ireland, that was absolutely key. 
um, the fact that there was, and I have no interest, I have no interest in sitting reading books about North, you know, the, the North or sitting reading books about Irish today. I, I never read any of that as a teenager. It just was such a total turn off because I was interested in anything that was kind of like pretty much beyond my, my immediate, um, my immediate experience. And I suppose in my writing, you know, I'm kind of trying to consider I suppose I'm not a particularly a nature person, so there'll be no descriptions in my books of like trees or, you know, I admire people who do that and I, and I enjoy it greatly, but, you know, there'll be no descriptions of, you know, particularly beautiful aspects of nature, but there probably will be quite a lot to do with the sounds and to do with the music um, as just a natural, what, what I see as a kind of a fabric of life. Um, and that's that's the way it is. Certainly not interested, I suppose, though, in trying to make characters cool. You know that they're they're interested in cool music or or, or something like that. I don't I don't really like that dimension. Sometimes um, that you kind of it's a sort of a shortcut to an interesting character that they listen to this cool music or whatever. Trying to not do that, I suppose. Daniela, if we could talk a moment um, about um, language. Uh, you don't write in your mother tongue. How much does this, um, not so much influence, but um, result in your, your practice? I, um, I would like to actually follow on with something that Wendy just said. Yes, of course. About, about, the, about how music uh, becomes part of the fabric of, you say the fabric of language, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I, I made me think how <laughs> how um, a good part of my English practice before I moved here came from listening to song and trying to translate song lyrics, <laughs> and how to date uh, my prose is full of hidden lyrics i keep using lyrics from songs like when i write because they just happen to be the right way for me to say something because the language there's there's a very heightened awareness of how the english language for me is constructed so there's never there's always like a step back thinking about what it is what i'm doing where do these words come from and they come a lot of them come from um uh, from song lyrics, actually, that's that's at least a, a, a very early, a very early fundamental uh, quality to the English language. So, so if you imagine that, it's ridiculous. Like when I was in my twenties, in my teens, um, and trying to hear this language, because you know, in Italy at the time, nobody, you know, there was no chance to travel or or even to see films. You know, we got everything dubbed. So this initial layer, imagine this horrible mesh of initial layer of language made from cut-ups from Joy Division by House and then Virginia Woolf. And I mean, it's like, <laughs> but it, feels, it feels very fundamental, uh, this initial encounter with that. And, and then going back to your question, yes, um, it, is, it, is, um, it is always, uh, strange to be yeah to be writing in a language that is not is not my mother tongue I I'm always out of sync um, doesn't matter how, how, how many tests and exams but there's always something that tells me that I'm not entirely here so um, and it's really hard to explain but um, no it's a it's a really interesting image it's, it's kind of like watching um music video on YouTube in another language and it's slightly out of sync, the yeah. dubbing yeah. or the dubbing's really bad. Yeah, yeah. so this, this becomes something that I've been trying rather than take as a shortcoming, I'm trying to work with it and try make to, it a virtue. to make it sound even more awkward sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, there have been uh, conversations with, with editors, for example, where I need, I need it to keep awkward. And I, the effort is to try and continue to sound Italian when I write, while I write in English and to, yeah, to, to, to maintain the level of non-proficiency when, you know, that kind of the level of non, uh, yeah, I, I'm really not interested in flawlessness. And I think that, I think that, uh, that um, impurity is, yeah, is really important for me when I construct this language, which is never poured out 
So there's a strong element of, of, of artifice. That's why I have really interesting conversations with, with artists. That's why I really like to, 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 for my practice to be, to exist in, in art context, for example, at a museum with musicians. Would, would you say that um, all writing is artifice? <laughs> um, in that it, it, it's, yeah, it's um, of I guess, yes, of course. Yeah, I guess, I guess in my case, um, it makes it more uh, immediate to have that, that awareness. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I guess I don't have that sense of, um, when I write in Italian, there's a different, well, I don't write in Italian anymore, which is another interesting thing. Uh, but, but when I write in Italian, there's a different um, uh, intimacy that I have with, with that sound, with their rhythm, with... And then there's, there's the problem of dialect, right? There's a problem of accents, there's a problem of... Well, there's no problem, there's the question of all these elements that then make you realize that a language is never pure. So, so you know, to be at a further remove with, with the Italian, with two dialects in my head that come from my family, and then being here uh, in, an, in yet another... Uh, stage of remove, so to speak, um, makes the artifice, uh, the sense of artis artifice even, even higher. And um, yeah, and it kind of pushing me, pushes me not to hide it actually, rather than, yeah, rather than trying to pretend. Uh, and you're also talking to two writers from the North of Ireland, so I mean, <laughs> that's not easy yeah, either. Exactly. Um, yeah. Just to go back to music, pure music, um, if you either if you could write sleeve notes for any record or album, what would that be and why? And that's a smash hits question, Wendy. You kind of know actually smash hits question what color Tuesdays, but um, so yeah, it um, yeah, basically, um, which sleeve notes do you wish you'd, you'd written for a musical album? That you love. Right, I would look right. I I would love to write the sleeve notes for Gene Clark, no other, because it's probably my favorite my favorite album. And um, I love it's been reissued. It was reissued um last year um with all sorts of outtakes and all all the rest of it. But I would love to I would love to do that. And I think it's so interesting what Danielle is saying about the song lyrics because I kind of think that as a as a writer, you're you're basically in conversation with everything you've ever you've ever heard. Um, so you're in conversation with all the films that you've 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 listened to, if you've seen. You're in conversation with all the poetry you've read, with all the other novels you've read, with all the crap you've read as as well. You know, um, with all of the songs you've ever heard. So I think it's a it's a lovely thing. I think it's a, a delightful thing to think that you know what what you're writing is is sort of bearing the fruits of having listened to Joy Division. I know that is absolutely the same for the same thing for me. And if somebody wanted to go through my stuff, they could be very, I could, they could be very specific. I think about what I have, I have um, taken from others in terms of the chimes in my work from from others, whether it's song lyrics or whether it's other novelists or, or whatever else. But oh, sorry, over over to you for the sleeve notes. <laughs> I was hoping you would go on talking. <laughs> But also all this lyric is like, it's incredible, isn't it? How do you, well, at least in my case, how do you remember all of these lyrics? I mean, sometimes it's like they come back <laughs> from long ago and it's incredible. I mean, the, it must have been, I mean, so much time, I mean, in my case, so much time spent trying to translate. And, and you know, and it's just like this stick, <laughs> stick in, your, in your memory and, and um, uh, yeah, it's it's just um, it's just really interesting, right? So um, albums, uh, can I say two? Of course you can, yeah. <laughs> right, I think that probably the closest to my current, let's say the closest to my current a current version of, of of writing might be something by Elian Radik, um, but but uh, but the goth in me would say. <laughs> <laughs> would say unknown pleasures by Joy Division. We said Joy Division. That's that's yeah. It could be loads of yeah, unknown pleasures. Yeah, and the Leon Reddy trilogy de la mort probably. 
Um, D Daniela, um, your first book on a beam um, pitched listening as an artistic practice. Could you explain that process? How, how listening is a practice? Um, at the time, that was, that was the first book I wrote uh, in English. Uh, and that was a couple of years after I'd arrived here. Um, and um, I guess there was a lot of uh, fairly academic writing being published around, around sound practices and listening as, as, a, as an artistic practice. And, and that's actually been incredible how in a um, relatively short amount of years, this, this literature has exploded. Uh, but I was, I mean, I was, I was interested in, in taking the idea of listening to, to the landscape and listening to, to a book and <laughs> listening to a painting, which David took as written extensively and beautifully about. I wanted to use that to try and, um, I guess, to try and negotiate my relationship with the city of Rome specifically, which is where I used to live before moving here. And, and how I could I could try and listen to listen to some memories of that place of that site and what that uh, might uh, bring about. So yeah, I I guess uh, that's how I ended up uh, writing the book and 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 also using listening as a a device or, or, or a method of not always telling the truth. It's really interesting because that book is written in the first person and there are many, many, many pages that are fictional and, and it's really, people are <laughs> confused about me writing as me, but, but uh, imagining places or, or, or imagining, imagining things or making up things that might or might not have happened in certain places in relation to, to my, my oral mem memories of those of those sites so yeah um we've um you've hit on some key words that i've written down transmission um re uh, receiving signals wendy um i know you've written for radio before um which is prose to be heard is that a different process for you from a uh, page prose oh that's really interesting um right i have um do you know what, right? Whenever, whenever I've been writing for the radio, I haven't thought too much. I haven't thought too much about that, um, but I per perhaps should have thought more about it. Um, and I've been, I've been thinking recently about how you know, reading is one of the. Of course, you can read aloud. Of course, you can have like an audio book. Of course, thing things can be on on the radio and so on. But I think it's one of the few. It's the only art form I can think of that requires. Um, an engagement um, with with art that that requires a degree of generation of internal sound, um, in the sense that sure you can read it aloud, you can hear sort of like you know physical audible properties and and all the rest of it, um, phonetics, you know phonology or whatever. But to engage with the text, you're also generating an, in some way um, an internal an internal sound, and so you know. Um, Texts require an, an internal voice, as it were. And so I suppose sometimes people will say with, with my stuff, um, oh, I didn't really get it until I heard you, until I heard you reading it. Um, you know, I didn't find it funny until I heard you reading it. And that's not because I'm making sort of really kind of abstruse jokes or something or other, right? It's that their internal, um, the, the internal sound, the, the internal kind of um, processing, um, of of whatever it was I was writing, um, hadn't quite worked out in favour of the text, if that if that makes sense. So they're kind of um, but the sort of auditory image of what I was writing, um, didn't quite didn't quite match what I was um, intending. Now, if you have your work on the radio, that can also be the case because the person reading your work on the radio <laughs> can also not quite get what the way you imagined this should have been sounded and. That can be maybe a, a frustrating, a frustrating thing. Um, 
So I find things to do with tone so interesting because I suppose determining tone involves you in some way. I mean, I don't know. I suppose it's a fascinating area. How do people read? How, how do you read? Do you do you sound in your head individual words? I, I personally don't. It's more like a sort of a, a, a flow. But what I do have in my head is a kind of a, a voice, I suppose, um, or, or, or a series of voices that I would use, different sorts of voices. And I'm trying to identify the tone of a, of a, of a particular piece and, and um, use that sort of tone in, in, my, in my head. Um, and I, I find that whole area really, really, um, really, really interesting. Um, I'm just having a look here and somebody's saying there, Shelley, you're saying about, you know, do I like hearing actors read writers as much as writers reading themselves? Um, I suppose in a sense, once you've written your work, you've given it away and people can do it people can access it whatever way they want but um i think it is a very striking type of art that requires an interior um sonic response basically and what about you daniela do you write many pieces for performance specifically i know you negotiate um through sound um and actually a lot of untranslated works as well but do you have um is, is that something you do a lot of? I've done a few things for, for um, uh, audio uh, specifically as a medium, but it was me reading, it wasn't other people. Um, and uh, I have done, uh, yeah, I've collaborated with musicians and done some, some live readings. I wouldn't say it is the primary, uh, the primary interest for me at the moment. Uh, it has been perhaps more in the past. Um, but uh, the thing in my case with, with my books, for example, is uh, uh, it was really interesting with Ephemeral actually. We did a launch at Cafe Otto where I gave the book to about 15 artists and performers and asked, asked them to remix the book to do whatever they wanted with it. And, and I was just curious to see what people would, would come up with without me giving scores or instructions, because that then it becomes really tricky. And I don't know if you, if you agree, Wendy, but what do you do? Do you give people instructions or do you just let them work with the material and do what they want with it? I, I was, you know, I was thinking, I was hearing you reading at the beginning and I thought I could never read this aloud. <laughs> with an Italian accent. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are certain strange boundaries which are not boundaries because of course I could. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so where, you know, how do you, how do you move in this um, uh, dial of possibilities? Um, and yeah, I mean, I've never, I've never given, given anybody, I've never given anybody instructions and occasionally I've heard people reading my work and the kind of um, nuances that they've brought to it through the reading, I find really, really interesting because it's just not how I imagined it. But at the same time, I've also heard people reading it and I've just thought, no. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot popping up in the chat here about poetry. I, um, I don't know about you, but um, kind of um, interpretation uh, or influence in the reading of the text. I find poets do it really well, especially the poets that read blankly, if you know what I mean, flatly, and zero emotion in their voices. So I'm gonna um, ask one final question, and this is for my students, and then I'm gonna invite questions from the audience. Um, so I mentioned, or did I mention Brian Eno earlier? I'm not sure I did, but um, I'm sure you both know his oblique strategies and what I'm doing with my students is kind of rewriting those, but also writing a manifesto. So if you could suggest a prompt or tip for unsticking creativity, what would that be? For unsticking creativity? Yeah, um, block, um, getting rid of, of creative block. Sorry, that was a very um, sticky sentence. <laughs> what would you suggest? Um... Do you know what? I, I I think just go out for a, go out for a walk. 
and decide to pick off the ground the first three things obviously not like dog poop or something but <laughs> pick, pick, pick the first three things that you see off the ground go, go for a walk I, I find walking about really really helpful um just just walking about and thinking about things pick three things off the ground that you find that people have just thrown away and take them home put them on a desk look at them think about them think about how you could possibly connect those things and it might not go anywhere at all or it might so that sure is pick up stuff but not mm-hmm. dog shit yeah exactly leave it good stuff uh, daniela do you have any um well, well mine would probably be be as uncreative as possible and just not <laughs> copying someone and and you know copy copy or translate if you know another language or, or copy someone literally and and something else is going to happen. I mean, it's about the, acti- the physical activity of being with a text that you're driven toward. Uh, inevitably something unhinges, <laughs> as I wrote in my text. And Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pop into the chat here. Some questions have come up already. Um, and Wendy picked up on, on that. Um, if anyone has any questions for Wendy and Daniela, please pop them into the chat box and I will read them right now. Here's one. Um, very interesting discussion, dubbing and remixing. Do you think creating is a toggling between the frame and the core? Where is it? Is it in the chat? It's in the chat, yeah. Oh, right. Between the frame and the core. I think it's all core. <laughs> I think that the way I'm seeing it more and more, it's it's really about um, about uh, yeah, learning learning to find this core and and then see whatever uh, uncontrollable forms or words might come from there. Um, yeah, definitely. Actually, I'm quite I'm quite convinced. Of that. What about you, Wendy? I think, you know, again, it, it depends on what you want to write. Um, but I think I would probably I would probably think it is a bit of a toggling between those two things. I read a really interesting book recently. It's just a short book, but it's by a guy. He's a, he's a um, keyboard player. He's called Chili Gonzalez. Um, and he wrote a book. It's called On Guilty Pleasures. And it's about how much he loves Enya. Um, and he's a totally un- unapologetic about loving Enya. Um, and basically that's the, the book's actually not anything about Enya. Um, it's about it's about music and it's about um how we respond to music and how we've got these kind of ideas about what's cool and what's not, whatever. But he wouldn't have written it if he hadn't been asked to write a book about unguilty pleasures and he chose Enya. Um so that was a quite an interesting idea of the um of 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 the frame that is kind of quite liberating because within the construct within the sort of um constrictions of that he managed to do something else. I suppose it, it depends what you're writing and I write short stories mainly and I suppose they kind of do have a have a type of a type of frame and there's a type of discipline to that um and you're trying to 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 work to condense things with within that. So from my point of view, and it's only my point of view, I probably, I would probably subscribe to that idea of it being a kind of a um, a, a compromise between the core and the compromise. The wrong word because that sounds that suggests it's sort of diminishing. Um, I think it is. What did they say? Toggle. Toggle's perfect. Toggle between the frame and the core. Or switch. Maybe. Yeah, switch. Switch is good. Um, Danielle, there's a question for you. Twenty minutes ago. Um, do you? I know you said you don't write in Italian anymore. But do you think in Italian or English when you are thinking about writing? Um, do you translate or do the words arrive in English? No, I don't translate. I'm a really bad translator. I find translation really difficult and problematic. And I, like I said before, I'd much rather be a stranger in English than, than try to do this, this work of... Uh, I mean, I don't think I can write in Italian anymore, to be honest. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, um, just finding my form, uh, a strange form in this language as it is, um, I don't think uh, in Italian. I think I think that basically my um, articulation of language for what I write is in English. And this strange 
strange composite and impure English that I've tried to describe. Um, yeah. It might be the odd interference from dialect, but <laughs> that's, that's an interference. And, um, I'm gonna do one last question here off the chat box. Um, do you, and if you find you write better alone, um, into thought or when others inspire you? Um, I suppose that's an echo of what you were both saying earlier that um, influence is all around you. Um, and when you're reading, you're pouring film and music and everything onto the page. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you, Danielle, but I, I, I do enjoy writing alone, but I write, I, my main place to work is my kitchen. Um, I'm writing in the kitchen, but people are constantly coming in, in and out um, and doing things, but I can, I sort of zone that out. So essentially, even though there are people around, I am, I am alone in my own, in my own mind. Um, but it's just exactly the point you're making, Susan. You're, you're alone, but you're also not alone because you're also as well the sort of, um, you know, the, the sort of composite of everything that you yourself have experienced as an individual and also everything that you've experienced kind of vicariously through music, art, film, I think, um, whatever, um, whatever else. And, you know, there's a really neatly thing that, um, Lisa McInerney said, I think, which she said with characters, which is kind of what I write about a lot of the time, that you're kind of excavating. She uses the word excavation of character as opposed to creation. I think that's nice because it's kind of like you're excavating maybe maybe what you already knew, what you already know, um, that you're bringing it to the surface as opposed to creating something entirely, entirely new. But also that's the question, where does writing begin, right? I mean, what is, I mean, where do you draw the limit? Are we talking of literally writing as in putting a certain words on a page or, because for me, one thing I'm missing for writing is going to live gigs. At the moment, I miss, I miss scrambling my thought without knowing that I'm scrambling my thought when I'm swimming or when I'm listening to some improv. Uh, that's not a designated sacred site of writing, but that's where, I mean, I used to have a, a notebook in my swimming bag because that's where things happen. Um, yeah, where, where, yeah, how do we designate these sites and, and how do you draw a line between I'm writing and I'm not writing because, yeah, like you're saying it's there and, uh, and it's there <laughs> and it's constantly there and, um, and also, uh, also editing. I mean, I can edit in really busy places, for example. I don't, I don't really care about that. But yeah, I think I think it depends also on what kind of writer you are. I don't I don't consider. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't see that limit. But yes, I will need that kind of <laughs> isolating moment now and then. Um, I don't know. Fascinating this idea of how do you, where do you start? And, and also you talk a, a lot about re-beginnings in, in, in your book, um, yeah. Singed. Um, yeah, about residues. Which is from before. Here. And that's available through Equus Press. Uh, thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you very much, Wendy Erskine. Thank Sweet you. Home is available through Picador now, I think, only, isn't it? Oh, I don't um, know. Thank you all for listening, all for tuning in. Thank you, Maynooth University, in particular, um, Tracy O'Flaherty, who's run the tech on the last two events, and Una Frawley. And thank you, Lucina Russell from uh, Kildare Library Services. Signed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.